Hello everyone. How are you doing? Got Aman here. Hello, Aman. Let me just see what these things are. Here, shut them off. There we go. All right. So Hello, Aman, 19 male India. Thank you for that. Says hello, Mehran. Hello. Anshis. Anshis, that's your first time here, isn't it? Huh? Says hello. Hello there. 17. 17 what? Um, oh, there it is. Male, 17, India. Thank you for that. Emmanuel, male, 28, Boston. Thank you for that. And... Paramesh Warar. Paramesh Warar says, hello, Mehran from India. Hello, Paramesh. And uh, don't forget to let me know age, if you will. And Chester is here. <laughs> Thank you, Chester, for being here, supporting the channel, and always making your presence and your energy in the channel. I appreciate that. That's uh, Mail 27 Hawaii. Aloha, Mehran, he says, and aloha to you as well. Dear Sid. Chester, I mean, <laughs> and says, how are you doing? Well, you know, um, I had a few appointments since our last uh, live stream earlier on uh, this afternoon, and then um, I enjoyed myself with some uh, nice, uh, um, and this is very cold right now. It's, it's supposed to snow tonight, so it's pretty cold, so everybody kind of tucked in, and I enjoyed some warm nice food watching uh, Cobra Kai <laughs> Karate Kid was uh, from my time and uh, I shared that with my son uh, when he was little we watched Karate Kid the original series uh, with uh, Mr. Miyagi probably I don't know God knows hundreds of times and it's part of our life part of our culture and so Cobra Kai coming out with uh, the new you, first on YouTube, first season now, then second and third on, I think it's on, uh, second also was on Netflix. And so I just watched them when I want to watch something pleasant that it feels like family because it's like we grew up with it. We know everybody there. <laughs> you know how it feels. So I enjoyed that. And uh, I thought maybe I'll uh, then start the live stream a little bit earlier instead of 9, 8.30. And um, Emmanuel says, the question I asked you earlier today is of an ontological nature. Sorry for the confusion. No confusion. <laughs> no confusion. And Parameshwarar says, male 27, India. Ah, thank you for that. And, and she says, so basically, I was in a relationship with a girl, and she moved to Canada. Oh, okay. And uh, we did long distance for some while, and when we broke up, now she's back in town, and I met her, and I'm scared that she's going to leave soon. Don't be scared. Listen, if you miss her, she misses you too, but you got to face the facts if she's immigrated to Canada, well, obviously it's not going to be convenient for you two to continue a long distance relationship. So while she's there, you enjoy your relationship. If it becomes stronger and you guys make plans, well, great. If not, then take it for what it is. Enjoy that as a joyful part of your life until next stage, which would be a girl that you meet, which would be more suitable as far as the logistics and so on is concerned and then you will find maybe a stronger bond with her and perhaps you guys would be willing to sacrifice or uh, for each other to the point that uh, if this one is not coming back from Canada to where you are or you you can't go to leave India and go to Canada well then uh, the other situation would prove more worthy for you guys to make certain sacrifices to make it all happen. So, um, she leaves soon, so she leaves soon. You think when she leaves, 
Only you gonna be the one to feel the vacuum of her existence, like vacuum of her, you know, the, the your environment uh, missing her. She would also have to be missing you, which she will be. So why are you scared? Why do you think that she's got the power that you're the only one, she's better than you, and you're going to miss her, but she's not going to miss you? And if you think and you say, she's not going to miss me, she's going to go to Canada, big deal. If she's not missing you, why should you miss her? Honestly, you met her and you think because she's gone to Canada now, I know how it is. You're in India, like if somebody was in Iran and comes back from United States or Germany and lives there and comes back for a visit. Oh, you know, hallelujah, they make a big deal out of, oh, she lives in or he lives in um, Europe as if it's a big accomplishment. No. You have a little bit of money. You have uh, intention. You can go to live to another country. But in that other country, you're still the same person. You still have to meet challenges. You still have to work. You still It's just the name Canada or name Germany doesn't mean that that person who lives in that country is not elevated herself to the point that it would be a credit for you to be around her. Nothing special about her just because she lives in Canada or Germany or, I don't know, France or wherever. So don't get fooled by the stereotype that uh, in, 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 traditionally in India, Pakistan, Iran, or places of Middle Eastern or rather in that Eastern uh, in neck of the woods, people have grown up to think that Europeans or the North Americans are better than them. Every nation has people who are maybe in the way of uh, education or experience or manners better than the other one, and the other one, some of them, not as better as the other one. So some Indians are better than Canadians, some Canadians are better than Indians, and the same with the Germans and the Japanese and the French. They're, in every country, there are portion of the people who have taken care of themselves educational-wise, mentally, physically, manner, morals, and they were, therefore they are in a higher caliber of standards of humanity. And in the same country, there could be people who are terrible. And another country is better than them in portion. So there is no monopoly on good people only live in India or Canada or um, Germany or France or Iran or wherever. There's always good people and bad people, educated people, uneducated people, with manners and morals, without much. They're all everywhere. So don't be fooled thinking that because Canada is an advanced country or Germany is an advanced country, France is an advanced country, then someone who travels from India or from Iran or from somewhere else in that neck of the wood goes to these advanced First Nations, suddenly that person's worth and value goes higher. This is how it seems from that end. That's why you think she's so special. What's so special about her? If she's not hanging around to be with you, her value is just as much as a good friend, that's all. Why would you think that suddenly she's, oh, I'm scared she's going to leave, but she's going to leave where? She's going to go to Canada. So the word Canada makes you think she's that great. Take that word off. She's the same girl she was living in your street or in the same city. So she's just as good as before or not any better than before just because she lives in Germany or France or somewhere in Europe or in North America. So what I'm trying to tell you is that get a hold of yourself. You are focusing on a mm, reputation of a country and you're confusing that with the accomplishments of this girl. This girl hasn't accomplished anything. What has she accomplished? Travel to Canada, lives in Canada, so big deal. You get me? All right. So, if she's if she thinks of you as much as you think of her, there should be a reason. What are your reasons to think so much of her? At one time you liked her, you were together, great. Now she's back, okay. Is she going to stay? 
If she is, great. If she's not, well, that shouldn't, you know, matter to you then. She's not that important. And remember, as I, what I always said, if this wheel doesn't turn for me, I don't care if it turns at all. So, whatever, whatever she has accomplished, wherever she lives, if, she, if she's not hanging around and be for you, to pay attention to you, to share life with you, it doesn't matter how good and wonderful she is or what amazing country she lives in. And uh, Chester says, wax on, wax off, yes, wax on, wax off, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it was such an amazing movie to me because I come from that background of, I don't know, maybe in some other life I was a samurai of some kind. <laughs> I have that, I like that Japanese culture very much or in that precision, uh, that, uh, you know, focus and discipline somehow about me. Maybe that's why I liked uh, Army uh, so much. <laughs> it kind of uh, discipline suits me at that well. But then um, um, somehow that whole culture of, what was I going with this? Uh, that whole, whole culture of uh, martial arts and uh, philosophy of Mr. Miyagi and uh, the whole story of the, the, the kid that was being bullied and how he grew older. So it's just uh, resonated uh, with, um, it was wholesome. It was wholesome. Yeah, it was a great movie, a good role model, good, good things, teaching kids. And, you know, it was a good movie. So to this day, it's still alive. So Parameshwarar says, mention some, foo some foods good for OCD and anxiety, your opinion. There's no food bad or good, but uh, uh, if you meditate... Uh, through meditation or mindful exercises, such as exercise, sports, or um, stretching, or something that you like to, even playing games, video games, or chess, or drawing, painting, uh, focusing on one thing wholeheartedly, mindful exercises. Even if you are having tea, you're focusing on tea and thinking about someone planted these plants and someone took the time and and cultivated them and then they harvested and they roasted it and it's now here packaged it, it's here appreciate it and drink it having this whole process in mind and the goodness of that tea going into your body so that's mindful exercises and through meditation mindful exercises there are certain neurotransmitters that is going to be increased in you about three, four hundred percent. One of these that is going to increase about thirty percent is GABA neurotransmitter, GABA. GABA neurotransmitters are actually specific to being anti-depression and anti-anxiety, and um, helps with the management of intrusive thoughts. So that's why, uh, among many other neurotransmitters that are created uh, in meditation, mindful exercises, GABA is one. Uh, serotonin, melatonin is the other. Um, decrease of uh, um, cortisol by 50%. Increase of uh, growth hormones uh, by quite a bit. <laughs> and these are all very important. So meditation is a very good part for handling OCD and substance of OCD. Emmanuel says, I just wanted to know what kind of thing is the mind without thoughts. Since it is because of thoughts that we know the mind. Well, you know, be careful again. Brain makes lots of thoughts that none of these thoughts have to do with the mind. Mind is not requested it, initiated it, is not knowledge, knowledge, it's not, it's not been known to the mind. It's a production of the brain. It's a mechanical process. Huh? Mind is not mechanical process, not a computation. Therefore, there is a difference between brain and mind. 
Mind is something that the brain doesn't reach. Thoughts don't reach the quality of mind, which holds your values. You know, your mind can have access to your values, to your principles, to what's meaningful to you, to your purpose, to your compassion to your consciousness, to your personality, persona. These things have nothing to do with the brain. That's why when the brain conjures up thoughts about your gender, your inclination, your this and that and so forth, different kind of OCDs or things that you're not interested in, it has got nothing to do with your personality, interest, persona, values, it has to do with the malfunction of the brain and the production of the brain. And the brain, because it cannot reach what you are, and it cannot reach your mind, they're two different things, therefore what brain conjures up in the topics that I just mentioned cannot actually be effective in changing, modifying anything about you, such as your gender, your inclination, your morals, your manners. Brain cannot change it by mere of suggestion or thoughts because brain is oblivious to the quality of the mind and what you hold sacred that mind can reach, but brain cannot reach it. Hmm? Mind does not betray you. Mind is you. Brain betrays you because brain is an apparatus, is not you. Brain is there for some calculations that you can use for advancing and accomplishing what it is that you want to accomplish. But on its own, it cannot reach you. You're beyond the reach of brain. And that has been, again, shown uh, with the proof of the works of Dr. Uh, Speary and Dr. Um, Penfield and Dr. Um, Owen and Dr. Leibet, all their experiments as in neuroscience and neuroscience and neurosurgery has proven that beyond the shadow of the doubt that you're not the brain and brain cannot reach who you are, let alone modify it, changing it, regardless of what kind of suggestion and what kind of a manipulation it does to make you feel certain way about certain things that you've never been interested in and you have no inclination or interest to be interested. <clears throat> yeah. Um, many Zandu says, HOCD, please help. Well, Manu, uh, Zen, uh, Manny, I have got God knows number of uh, videos on the two playlists, Intrusive, Transient, OCD, HOCD, Negative Thoughts, and Intrusive, uh, OCD, HOCD, Short Videos. These two playlists um, have everything you want in them. And of course, you have uh, uh, referral links to... Uh, discussions and videos presented by Dr. Schwartz, a neuroscientist, in uh, regards to neuroscience of habits, in regards to brain lock, in regards to that you're not the brain, and the brain is not you, in regards to thoughts and brain, and then the links for Dr. Philipson, who's an expert in OCD and HOCD, and, and Dr. Jan Weiner, and these are all experts that if you ever want to go to any uh, psychotherapist or clinical psychologist, you must make sure that they're experts in OCD and HOC and the substance of OCD in general. Otherwise, not every psychologist can understand uh, OCD and its subsets the way specialists can. And uh, SUB sub says, greetings, I have a question which reflects from my past. It is possible. Is it possible that, let's say, sexual OCD triggers by consuming psychedelics? Possibly. I've never consumed psychedelics, so I don't know really 
uh, what it does, but I bet you it will take you out of the control, out of the focus, out of your character, and, you know, uh, let's go your uh, togetherness uh, loosens up all what holds you together, so you become someone that you haven't been. I mean, that's what my understanding is, although I'm not an expert in that. And so, it's like you have uh, put together a certain structure with certain material that is necessary to put them together, including um, glues, screws, uh, staples, uh, nails, um, all kinds of binding substances and material and equipment. And then this structure is solid. And they took all these things off. Well, that structure is not going to keep its shape because all the stuff that was keeping it together in a certain shape and design and direction and focus is no longer there. It's like by psychedelic drugs, perhaps... Uh, what it does, it takes away all your understanding of your principles, of your goals and uh, values and what's meaningful to you and um, all what describes you and, I, I, and, 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 and puts you together the way you know yourself, your consciousness, your persona, your compassion, your education, your interests, your... Um, inclinations everything that is you is that has constructed you the way you are the image and the persona and character that has that you negotiate day-to-day -day life psychedelic drugs to me seems like it will just take them all off and you become someone that you have no idea who the hell you are because all those programs all those understandings all those uh, bindings uh, for the purpose of values that are meaningful to you, they're no longer there to keep you as who and how you designed and worked hard to uh, create and, and uh, sculpture yourself, your character. So naturally, you could, I don't know, you could go nuts and you wouldn't even know it. And Sharky says, male 17, California. Hello, Sharky. She has been struggling with HOCD. I have considered myself straight my whole life. Then you are, and you'll never change. These are just stuff that the brain uh, is uh, uh, malfunctioning and the signaling system, and you're being the victim of it. So uh, understand that. And uh, let's see what it says. And I've considered myself straight my whole life, but when I was a kid, I had thoughts attacked me since middle school and I believe that means I'm bi hated. No, it means nothing. It just means that the brain is malfunctioning on its directive to communicate to prefrontal cortex. Cortex makes a suggestion and if that suggestion is not uh, in line with your values whether it's about a certain morality or certain gender or certain behavior or compassion, whatever it is that makes you who you are. If that suggestion by the cortex, prefrontal cortex, is not in line with your values, inclination, gender, whatever it is that makes you who you are, then there is a, a centerpiece of a system called the striatum, which in it, as part of basal ganglia, it's called caudate nucleus. Caudate nucleus's job is that when it realizes there is a suggestion that to you, to your persona, character, gender, understanding, inclination, and preference is obscene or uninteresting, Caudate nucleus's job is to recognize that based on knowing, being aware of what your values and your gatekeeper is, what your 
inclination, what your preferences, what's meaningful to you, what makes you who you are. Knowing that, Carded Nucleus' job is to shut these intrusive thoughts that are not meeting up with the standards of your values and shut them off. But when there is a malfunction in the signaling system, meaning Carded Nucleus doesn't work properly as automatic as it is designed to work, like the automatic gear shift of a car that is supposed to change gear from one speed to another, and then when it's not appropriate to go that fast or to go that route or whatnot, it changes back. It's like that. It acts automatically when it senses certain things that are not in its program, and it changes shift, and in this case, called it nucleus, shuts off that thought. In other words, everybody on Earth has intrusive thoughts. Everybody. But when it shows up and it makes you uncomfortable, so oh, that's nasty thought, whatever it is, to you, to every person, different thing, but to you, it's nasty. So that's a nasty thought. Then call it nucleus, shuts it up, and it's working properly, and then you go on about your business and you're focusing on whatever it is that you want to focus. But when there is an OCD and malfunction in the signaling system of the brain, mainly in that, uh, in this um, uh, topic, call it nucleus, call it nucleus doesn't automatically work as it's supposed to work. So the prefrontal cortex has made some suggestion, but there is no response coming back to say, no, we're not interested, shut it off, don't make that. That signal doesn't get back to prefrontal cortex. So prefrontal cortex says, hey, I didn't get any response. So repeats it to the point that this thing is hovering and there are no response, no shutting off, no closing the door, no nothing. It's hanging on. And you, having been brainwashed since childhood, that brain is you, whatever brain says, it's smart. That's what makes the decisions for you. Brain is you. And you see that thought is hovering. It's not disappearing. And you're not noticing there's a malfunction in the signaling system of the brain. You say, well, because it's hovering and it keeps being there, it must mean that it's trying to tell me that's what I've always been. I'm in denial. No. It just simply means the fucking thing is not working well. There are challenges of this working properly as it's designed. So you got to now get off your ass like you used to have remote control and you would change channels from TV from afar. Now remote control is lost or it's not working. The battery is not there. So you got to get off your butt and go and manually change that channel. So when the thoughts show up of this caliber that is not of your interest, and it's not automatically shut down, the remote control is not working, so what you got to do, you got to recognize it, that this is an obscene thought to me, this is an intrusive thought to me, recognize it, and then call it for what it is. That's intrusive thought. It's not me. That's OCD. It's not me. That's HOCD. It's not me. That's brain. It's not me. Any one of these, you call that thought, that intrusive thought, for the name, for that what it is. It's not me. It's OCD. It's not me. It's the brain. It's not me. It's HOCD. It's not me. It's intrusive thought. So you recognize the quality of the thought. You called it for what it is, and then you ignore it and go about it. You don't try to hunt, data hunt it. You don't try to... Um, combat with it. You don't have to debate with it. You don't have to shut it down crazy, kill it, destroy it, disappear. None of that shit. Just recognize its quality, understand that it's not of your liking, call it for what it is, and ignore it. That is like getting off the couch and actually physically going and manually changing the channel or turning the TV shut off. off. So your behavior toward these intrusive thoughts will do the job of carded nucleus that is supposed to shut it. In other words, you ignore it, and you ignore it, and you ignore it, and you ignore it, and you ignore it, until the brain starts rewiring yourself. says, holy shit, every time I make up these sort of things, he doesn't play with it, he doesn't respond to it, he doesn't debate with me, he ignores it. That means he's not interested, or she's not interested in these thoughts. And because it's not interested, it learns that there is no player in this, no interest, so it should stop making these thoughts and reduces is making these thoughts because through your behavior, it is being rewired.
and then eventually cardioid nucleus catches on and resets and clicks back into position and does his work as it usually. And whenever it shows up again, you're aware what it is. You're not going to get confused. Oh, my gender is changing. I've always been in there. None of that shit. You just realize there's another malfunction and it happens because our brain is only 40,000 years old. It's not as old as we've been around for a million years or so. It's only 40,000 years old. It's malfunctioning left and right. That's why there's so much mental problems in this world. And welcome to the human brain. It's a work in progress. It malfunctions and you have to understand that and deal with it as you deal with the crazy person. That you understand is imbalance, is making mistakes, so you learn how to deal with it. And you got to learn not to believe this. This is not deity. This is not your smart. This is not you. This is your brain. It's an apparatus. It's a tool. It's stupid. It has no knowledge. It's not an intellect. It's, it's only an equipment. So you got to take it as that and treat it as that and view it as that. Hang on, guys. Let me open this door. It's a little bit warm. It's fresh air coming out. Hang on. All right. Sharky, do you understand what you're actually saying? You know, Sharky, you're, you're saying, uh, I feel like since I, I keep denying these thoughts, that means I'm actually bi or gay. But I hate being gay or bi, only love being straight. And that's what you are. The thing is, you think what suggestion, images, or thoughts show up, that's the identifier of you. That's a representation of you. It's not. It's a brain. It's not your um, identity what shows up in your head. It's a brain's conjuring up thoughts because brain finds its security in occupation. Occupation means making thoughts. And it makes thoughts not considering who you are, especially when there is a malfunction. It makes thought because its job is to make thought. That's all. It's a thought manufacturing plant. It's got nothing to do with who you are. It has to do with the brain making thoughts out of anxiety, out of wanting to be active, out of the fact that it's got all kinds of information from internet and publications and billboards and talks and TV programs and everything else seeped up into your consciousness and it gets its information to make all these 80,000, 90,000 thoughts a day out of this. And this has been filled with all kinds of things, information that exists in the world. All brains have become aware of all these different topics. Everybody's personal lifestyle is on TV, talked about, on publications, pictures, billboards. Everything has been, there's nothing private anymore. So everything that is out there has found its way as part of information in the consciousness and brain picks it up and makes thoughts. But that has nothing to do with who you are. You're allowing a brain, a tool, an apparatus to actually define who your gender Brain didn't even exist. Ability to thinking didn't even exist when you were being created in the wombs of your mother and your gender was chosen according to the gene and the chromosome, whatever it was that created you. Thinking ability was not even there until you were born maybe a few months to a year after. Speaking ability and all that was not even there. The brain wasn't even developed. So when nothing was developed, you were being created. The creation 
is different than it, it wasn't the responsibility of the brain. So when brain wasn't around, wasn't even able to function when you were being created in the womb of your mother, brain has nothing to do, will never have anything to do with actually modifying or changing you in any shape or form in anything, let alone your gender. So if you understand this, then you know that what you're saying, it just could have one, under, one meaning, and that is the brain is conjuring up thoughts and according to the malfunction of the signaling system to the, of the brain, it just hovers there and makes you think, oh, because I'm denying. No, you're denying it because you don't like it. Well, you're supposed to say, no, uh, I don't like um, walnuts, but I have to eat it in order to prove that I don't like it. Of course, you're going to say, no, thank you. Denying doesn't mean you are. It says, no, thank you to walnut. That means what you, you, you want... Uh, you want it? So, uh, somehow something has gone wrong. People think what you're not interested, that means, oh, you're interested. Well, you just know who you are, what you are. And you know that you're not interested of that. And just because the brain is malfunctioning, you think, oh, because it's showing up more than a few times. And No, if it shows up a million times, it still means nothing. And uh, and I, I think I responded to the rest of it. You can use that and understand it. Hmm. No, no, no. Just because you don't like something, that doesn't mean, oh, because I'm denying it, then I must be liking it. No, no, what the fuck is that? So to be a good heterosexual, you got to be a homosexual to be considered a good heterosexual. What the fucking bullshit is this? Or the homosexual, to be a good homosexual, he should be a heterosexual or she should be a heterosexual in order to be considered good homosexual. It's just what? What is it? Opposite Wednesday? What's going on? So don't, don't, get, don't make too much. Don't interpret any of these thoughts. It doesn't matter the topic of the thought. All it matters is it's just out of anxiety and out of the fact that you're so diehard interested in what you are and you're trying to protect that to the point that if the smallest, a thought, even a thought that's got nothing to do with you, it has, it's the brain's thought, shows up, you want to defend yourself, you want to go after it, you want to say why it's there. And all that creates more anxiety and makes you think it must be something. No, there's nothing. It's just the brain making thoughts. That's what it does. Like your intestine takes food, makes energy, and then shits the rest out. Makes shit. But shit is not you. It's one of the things that the intestine does. Brain too. It makes shit thoughts. But because it makes thoughts, that doesn't mean whatever thought shows up in your head, it's your thought. It's not your thought. It's brain's thought. Brain is an equipment. Sometimes you use the equipment to calculate something, figure out something, produce something, design something, accomplish something. And when you don't use it, or learn something, and when you don't use it, the brain itself uses its own apparatus and makes thoughts, all kinds of thoughts. It's got nothing to do with you. You have to understand the separation of brain, you, and thoughts. Then you'll be fine. Otherwise, every shit that shows up in your, in your head, it's not you. It's not your responsibility, your interest. It's the brain. you got to understand that. Watch my um, latest upload. Are you... Or the brain is you. That's 50 minutes. But it scientifically proves to you that you're not the brain and brain is not you. So whatever brain conjures up thoughts, naturally it's not you. So watch that and perhaps it will be helpful. And then watch uh, the psychotherapists and uh, uh, psychologists links that I put in there. And then educate yourself and understand the relationship between thoughts, brain, and you. No, Manny. Whether you accept or don't accept, it doesn't mean whether they increase the number of thoughts that shows up or not, doesn't change you. It's just annoys you. So the best thing to do is do what I said to you. Recognize what they are, call them for what it is, and then ignore them. Let them be. Thoughts are allowed to be there. Let thoughts be.
just like anything else in this world is, but they don't change me just because they're there. I see them, but that doesn't mean because I see them, it's my interest. I am capable to see, witness things. Same thing here. Thoughts show up. You recognize thoughts have showed up. Just recognizing the presence of such thought having popped up or has appeared doesn't mean anything. Just let it be. But focus on what it is that you prefer and you think is represents you and you're interested in and focus on your life. Let these things be. You don't have to fight with them, deny them, accept them. Okay, okay I, I realize this, you're there. Okay, thank you, but I'm not interested. Move on. You keep doing it and eventually it works out fine. One of the things you really want to do is sleep well. Sleep on time, sleep well, meditate and get engaged in things you want to learn, things you want to enjoy, and uh, just ignore thoughts. Ignore like you walking in the street or going about your business. You see all kind of debris and garbage and shit all around the street, but you don't keep looking at them. You notice them, and then you notice uh, how you should negotiate your pathway, and you go. You don't keep paying more attention to them. You just enough to notice they're there, so you don't you know walk on them. You go. That's it. That's pretty much it. That's why you notice them, and that's good. And Atif says, you skipped my me. Oh, did I? Where are you, Atif? Ah, Atif says, hi, Mehran, 38, male, New York City. Since the last live stream, I tried to have relations relations with someone and still had the problem with erectile dysfunction thought I tried to relax no you're, you're still thinking about it hmm? you're too excited to make sure you leave a good impression on her that I'm the best I'm a, I love her so much I'm gonna do the best I'm gonna make her really like me and enjoy it. just don't give a shit <laughs> don't don't be rude to her, but just don't don't give it so much. Oh, my life depends on it. My manhood depends on it. If I fuck her well, that means I'm a real good stuff. If I don't, oh, that could mean something. I could mean that I, I am not heterosexual. No, 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 that shit. Don't connect anything to anything. Everyone at one point in life, they are too anxious, too excited, this and that, so forth. They didn't get the result that they wanted with the girl that they were with. So what? Because too much of excitement and wanting to prove your oh I'm that man that I know I am. Don't have to prove it. Stop proving things to people, you'll function well. And stop proving uh, things to your brain. The brain is stupid. All right. Emmanuel, are you on something? <laughs> so it seems as though the mind does not need the brain. What's the brain for then? Listen, if you watch the video that is 50 minutes and you said you watched it, it explains to you that one of the philosophies in the past was the, uh, the relationship theory, that they kind of thought the relationship with the mind and uh, brain is like computer in the program. But that's not it. Brain can be used for computing, but mind is does no computation. So brain has got its job, material process, a process of computing and so on. But mind doesn't do computing. Mind has got all kinds of other value systems in there. Mind is above the brain. Mind, through mind and your values, you judge the brain. So it's not like the brain doesn't have its place. Brain is necessary for the things that it needs to do for us under our direction. But it also does its own thing by making all kind of thoughts that is unbeknown to you. You're supposed to understand that so you won't mix up what the brain says is the same as if you're saying it. No, it's not true. 
You gotta be aware of that so you won't get confused and you won't let the brain's malfunction or its intention interfere with your uh, prime directive in life. All right. Emmanuel, for all these questions, you got to watch that video that I put in there. Otherwise, I, I can go on 50 minutes, 15, 50 minutes of... Uh, bring, that's why I made that video, to make all these clear for you. And Sub says, Doctor, I would like to know if you yourself have... Look, I'm not a doctor. Make sure I'm not a doctor. I have no medical credentials. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychotherapist. My research and the book I've written on me, my psyche, and I, and how fear, thoughts, consciousness, desire, ego, and material process, mechanical process, order, and so on is, is based on my research and my experiences and my writings and what I've learned from the scholars of hundreds of years ago. I'm not a doctor. Uh, so, understand that. Then he says, uh, if you yourself have dealt with OCD, oh yes, all my life, since childhood, I've had all kinds of OCDs. You know, turning lights, switch off and on, God millions, million times, making sure the door is locked, the, is the oven off, making sure, responsibility, OCD, I'm making sure nobody gets harmed because of me. All kinds of intrusive thoughts, all that. All of that was without any knowledge of the separation of brain, thoughts, and me. Because from childhood, nobody teaches us how to train the brain. Nobody teaches us the function of the brain. We get duped to think that the brain is us. Whatever comes up, it must be a representation of us. And unless we research and find out and learn, these things can haunt you. And you go out to fight with them in order to prove that you're not there because you know who you are and you know your preferences and you're trying to protect it. And when something like that shows up, you think, oh, it's me saying that, but I know I'm saying no, but it's me saying that, but I know. Well, who is, which one was you? So you have to understand that the brain is not you. And for that, I've made many videos that clearly helps you to see that. And then you'll relax and you let the bullshit of the brain just be there because brain is a bullshit maker. It, may, it does lots of good things, calculation, things that we need to use it for, but it also makes nonsense and garbage. It's got nothing to do with us. You got to be able to put the brain its in own pray, place and see what it is good for and don't give it so much credit as if it represents you, as if it shows up with some kind of suggestions. It's a, oh, it's true. No, not at all. Yes, I've had my share of uh, all kinds of OCD. <laughs> Perhaps that's why I understand it well, <laughs> I think. Uh, in, in, in this uh, channel, we have got lots of um, uh, videos on OCD, different, uh, different uh, series talking about OCD. OCD, childhood, did you say goodnight to your parents? God knows a million times. Good night, mom. Good night, dad. Good night. Good night. You think you got to say it one more time in order to make it all symmetric. Or you might got to say it one more time. Otherwise, something bad will happen. All these have a stems from childhood and insecurity and fear and anxiety. Um, could be many reasons. One could be that you love your life and you want to make sure you protect that life. Nothing happens to that comfort and that family and the good things that you have. The little toys, the little vacations, the things you love about your life. The life itself. And you start, because you're looking for psychological security and you don't know how to get it, how to make sure that this would be protected, you start dealing with an unknown. You create out of your own thoughts something out there that is going to grant you some kind of immunity or protection by doing certain weird things. 
and you do it a few times, nothing bad happens, and you think, oh, see, I was right, so maybe I should continue. It doesn't hurt. Before you know it, you're touching the light switch a million times before you get out of the door. And then you start doing weird things. You start making noise. Uh, uh, mm, mm, mm. Or then you don't want anybody to hear it. You do it in your own mind. Mm, mm, mm. Then you just, it just goes nuts. And you've got to understand it and cut it off and understand that if you don't touch that uh, uh, light switch 10 times and you touched it five times, You'll see nothing happens in the next couple of days. So next time you touch it three times instead of five times. Then you touch it two times instead of three times. Then you touch it once. Nothing happens. So that whole business of thinking, I got to touch it ten times, so making sure nothing happens was just in your own mind. Huh? Or making sure these things are all lined up in the table when you put them. You know, have you been trying to line up things, making sure everything is... These are all just out of insecurity and anxiety, and you're trying to bring that psychological security, a certain kind of a security for yourself. And you start making, dealing, because one part of your thought is now watching what you're doing and has, cre has been created in your mind as a deal with something out there. <laughs> it's just pretty stupid, but at the time, you're seeking that security and you're kind of willing to make all kinds of make-beliefs, especially when you tried it and suddenly be, you think, oh, I touched it 10 times yesterday and I passed my exam. I didn't fail. Because you didn't have to do that. The outcome would have still been the same, but you don't understand it. And usually starts at childhood. So, yes. Then cleaning things. Washing my hands or cleaning things. Uh, this is dirty and so on. Oh, it was exhausting. But in my life, because I had a strong mind, I decided that I got to fix this. That's not... And usually when you get a little bit uh, tense, things are challenging in life, uh, whether it's economics or things happening to family or whatnot, you become more in tune with doing these uh, compulsions. To the point that you say, enough is enough. Either you say enough is enough and you reverse it, I use your power of mind or you just go to hell like you continue to become worse and worse I could see that this is going to be hmm, pretty bad I can't be bloody cleaning everything with alcohol every time I touch it or somebody touches it so I started reversing retraining myself not knowing about any of these scientific discussions and scientific experiments and research that I've done during the past many, many years. Way before this, I got rid of it all on my own because I just saw that is not the way of the universe. That is not the way of nature. I should be in line with nature. I should not allow superstitious or these sort of negative thoughts rule my life. The strong mind must decide and you are capable of deciding. So I started reprogramming myself and bit by bit diminishing from it until I reconditioned myself through neuroplasticity, which I didn't know what it mean, meant at the time. But that was my intention and it was work. Then I, of course, I became more interested to years later. And the more I studied, the more I researched, the better it got because I got more ammunition by learning about all these you know studying from the scholars of a few hundred years ago learning the movement of mind fear desire anxiety the psyche ego and all these and trying to learn the components and the relationship between thoughts and consciousness and so on and the roots of it and all that then uh, you know, seven eight years later then Everything started becoming uh, part of what I share with you guys. All right.
All right, Chuck. Good. And uh, Chuck says, "Thank you, sir. I'm going to see." How to deal with these thoughts without acting. Thank you, sir. You're quite welcome. Uh, don't lose hope, guys. You are in command. If you watch that video, I'm going to put the... Look, I want you guys to understand beyond philosophical understanding that started with uh, Aristotle a thousand years ago, maybe. Uh, today, neuroscience has scientifically proven without the shadow of the doubt that you're not the brain, and brain is not you, and brain cannot reach you. Therefore, I'm going to put that uh, um, link of that video that I just uploaded maybe a week ago, and I want you guys to enjoy that information and watch it. And uh, here it is. This is for you to enjoy and educate yourself and this is based on the presentation that Dr. Egnar had, and I have used uh, many segments of it in order to uh, re-explain it in maybe similar but a little bit different, possibly, with more explanations. And here it is. So you hope you will enjoy it and will be helpful to you. And Rogara, Rogara. Rogaara sounds like Hawaiian because ah ah ga ah. Rogaara says you have great vibes. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Rogaara says, how do you tell if your thoughts are true or not? Well, you always must know that brain is an apparatus that you use it to do certain things for you. But when you don't use it, the brain itself uses its own apparatus to make thoughts. That's what it does. 80, 90,000 thoughts a day. And all of them, most of them, if not all of them, are irrelevant to you. So when you want to know if it's useful to you or not, you'll gauge it. You're the judge. You decide, should I veto this thought? Should I choose or not? Your choices and veto is the power not the thoughts or suggestions. They can show up as many times as they want. But you're the ultimate judge that judges those the quality of those thoughts, whether it's uttered by people, opinions, and their suggestions, or whether it's uttered or suggested by your own brain. You treat them the same. You judge them, you veto them, or you choose them, depending on if it does serve you at all or not. And when you gauge thoughts that show up, pop up in your head, while you just have to categorically ignore them because they're not summoned by you, they popped up, you're not involved in creation of them. But if you actually wanted to see how, then maybe I should gauge it, this one, I'm not sure, then you will gauge it against your values. You have certain values based on what's meaningful to you, what's mannerism of yours, what's your character, what's your beliefs, maybe your faith, your gender, your inclination. All of these are sacred values that are safeguarded in your core principle, in your super consciousness, in your gatekeeper, in your wise advocate. Uh, different words uh, used by Dr. Schwartz, Dr. Philipson, and so on, and uh, super consciousness is what I use it for. So then you gauge it against the values that you have, you are safeguarding in your super consciousness. And you see if these thoughts, certain thoughts, measure up, are in line with your values or not. If they are, then you'll see if they're useful to you for that, whatever it is you want to use them. If they're not, you say, well, it's not within my values, not, not meet up, meet with my standards. Therefore, I don't care where it comes from, whether people said it or my own brain uh, uh, created it, uh, I disqualify it and I ignore it for the reasons that it doesn't measure up to my values. And sub rogara, oh, sub stuck into rogara, okay. 
And um, Billy Hawk says, Mail 24 Greece. Ah. Says, My ex suddenly broke up with me out of the blue one month ago. We had long distance relationship, but I did not want to move in with her as she did. Quarantine was also in between us. Okay. Billy Hulk says suddenly two weeks later she moved on with someone in another city and she has a job. I feel I'm blind in life, betrayed and completely demotivated, even though I'm working my way to master degree. <laughs> Look, why do you say that? You actually think you should continue being interested to be in a relationship with someone who actually flips like this two weeks after you tell her that you're not interested to move in. Maybe she took that as something that she had to move on and secure her life and perhaps, I don't know, the other guy is going to help with the rent and she had to move some kind of economic situation. Whatever the reason was, she used it to move on. And you still think that kind of a girl is suitable for you? <laughs> Why would you think this is not a good occasion for you to have found out the real character and resiliency of her in the light of challenges that you found out before you get more serious with her? So this is a good news. Why do you think that you, you missed out something? No, you just found out something. That you made the right move not moving in with her. Because her intention is not as serious or, or honorable as yours because she can do this in a spare moment in two weeks with somebody else. And if she has, then that disqualifies her from being a candidate to be in a relationship with you. Why would it make you more interested in her when you see something that is not measuring up to your standards about a girl that you want to be with? That's what you should be focusing on. So right now, it frees you, frees your, it gives you clarity, frees your consciousness about any responsibility of any kind. You're free to focus on your master and get your degree and go and get a good job that you want. And then, in time, when you're ready, you will find a more suitable companion, more suitable friend, more suitable um, mate, and you will find her uh, uh, qualified to focus on and pay attention to. So this, if you look at it without prejudice, without ego, you say, hallelujah, it actually worked out perfectly well. Because I said, I don't want to move in with you. She went and moved in with another guy. So the hell with it. What kind of girl is that? Why would I want her? Why would I even want to be with her? I'm glad I found that out. Yeah, you might be hurt because, you know, you were, you know, intimate or whatever. But, ah, damn it doesn't. Another. Go fix yourself. Fix your future. Be able to provide for yourself, for your family. And then when you have those credentials, there will be more girls finding you suitable and qualified and then you will have uh, choices rather than just uh, out of greed or out of um, competition or out of ego um, that, oh, oh no it's mine ah, but it's yours don't fall into that trap of oh i want to possess it's mine it's 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 mine nobody can play with um, you know my bicycle no oh, come on if the bicycle allows somebody else to i don't know <laughs> let him, let him <laughs> it wasn't a good example. It was coming out wrong. So I stopped <laughs> completing the example. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> all right. Billy Hulk. Come on, have some respect for that screen name that you have uh, used. Hulk. Hulk is not going to cry out for some girl who's gone to somebody else's, you know, whatever. Just move on, Hulk. Be a Hulk. God damn it. <laughs> Manny says, okay. 
Manny says, I didn't ask for original response. It just showed up of nowhere the morning I woke up with HOCD. I'm facing this from a month. Yeah, I don't, you know, don't take it seriously. It's, it's brain. So many people in this pandemic, because they're constantly, it brings that kind of a know, disappointment, depression, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it's like the train going out of uh, rail. Uh, it, it puts a, you know, screw between your wheels that you're trying to travel with your bicycle. <laughs> so you kind of all get into uh, intrusive thoughts more than before. Because everybody has intrusive thoughts, regardless of who you are, what you are, what age you are. Intrusive thoughts are all over. But when there is a pandemic and the activities are limited and you're not busy with all the things that you were dealing with, the intrusive thoughts starts hitting more. And I don't know what else is involved. I don't know what kind of a weird uh, electromagnetics are maybe involved because the number of people with uh, OCD and HOCD is just going higher and higher. And obviously, they're all because of some uh, malfunction uh, due to um, distraction and uh, anxiety and the pandemic has increased the level of anxiety naturally is going to have uh, something to do with the mental state of ours and is going to affect it. So you got to be smarter than that and understand all these what we're trying to uh, relay here and uh, separation, understanding the complete separation, underst the complete understanding of separation between brain uh, thoughts and you will help you to deal with this thing especially when you're aware about the role of caudate nucleus, uh, malfunction in the signaling system of the brain, and therefore you'd be able to manage it better and then rewire yourself through neuroplasticity, through the way you behave toward these intrusive thoughts by your understanding the intrusive thought being present, calling it for what it is, and ignoring it moving on to the direction that you prefer to move about. And that behavior ends up rewiring your brain and through neuroplasticity, these sort of intrusive thoughts will be rewired and retrained and they won't be shown up as often. And if they do, you always know what they are. So it wouldn't be a hazard to you. It wouldn't be a, a terrible thing for you to be scared of it or get you anxious. You just, okay, fuck it, it's a thought. It's a thought. It can stay. Thoughts are like people and different lifestyles and different animals and different products. They all exist, but you have the choice to choose it or veto it or not choose it. That's it. That's how we live. So brain conjures up all kind of shit and you have the same choice as you have in regular life. Veto, choose it or not choose it. You have the power. So therefore, don't get anxious about it. Let it be. Let it be and it will let you be. Don't worry about it. It's annoying, yeah. But that's okay. Cognitive behavior therapy is different than ERP. So you got to find somebody who... ERP is the choice. Cognitive behavior therapy, uh, therapy uh, you know, it's also something, but some psychologists, most psychologists prefer uh, ERP. <laughs> some says, Dr. Maybe not a question that is necessary necessarily about this topic. But do I see Goku in the background? First of all, again, for the second time, God damn it, I'm not a doctor. I don't want to mislead anybody here. I don't want anybody to be misled. I am not a doctor. Read my lips. I am not a doctor. <laughs> I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychotherapist. I have no medical degree or credentials whatsoever. <laughs> I'm an author of the book, Me, My Psyche, and I, 
And my research is on thoughts, consciousness, fear, desire, ego, mechanical process, order, all this movement of mind. But I am not a doctor. Understand that. So you need to talk to your doctor, psychotherapist, psychologist. Go talk to them. And under their supervis uh, supervisory supervision <laughs> and uh, achieve your goals. And uh, you can also enjoy my videos as a extra um, uh, information is out there. All right. Let's see. Hmm. And um, Aman says, I talked with a psychotherapist uh, for HOCD. He said that CVT is part of ERP. He didn't let me ask him questions, act and talked rudely. Then when I asked about how many years of experience he had, he said, we don't need to justify our work and hung up the call. <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> you did good, Aman. Should I do my treatment from them? Well, no, they need to justify. Uh, if the psychologist is stupid enough, that is not open enough, is not willing to bring your trust by offering information that seems to be important to you about his or her experiences, length of uh, being in that field. Uh, how many cases has he done? Does he know about these in particular? The fact that he says uh, what he said to you obviously is not the right. Uh, go for some psychotherapist or psychologist who's actually specializing in OCD and uh, HOCD and so on and is willing to be open and bring clarity rather than uh, being high and mighty. Uh, the first thing he got to do, I think he should be talking to me to deal with his ego. <laughs> I'll charge him less than he charges you. <laughs> and <laughs> Namita says, hello, Meran. Hello, Namita, dear. How have you been? 22 female India. You haven't been here for a while, long time. I think you were here a few times before. And Namita says, please tell me how to deal when you get anxious about certain situations that you have no control ever over. I have a problem with overthinking, especially at night. Well, you know, it needs a little bit more uh, information as far as what kind of thinking it is. We can go and try to find the roots of it together. And perhaps at one point you may want to book a Skype consultation with me so we can one-on-one -on -one discuss this uh, topic of, uh, that you're uh, concerned about. Otherwise, this is very generic. Uh, it, it depends on what it is that you're thinking about. And perhaps that would uh, help us to explore it together uh, a little bit better. Um, Sub says, how do you deal with philosophical OCD? It feels for me like I enjoy seeking truth. Also, sometimes it feels frightening. No, there is much out there. No, it's not frightening. You have to understand our lives are limited. You do what you can in this period of life, and you try to understand as much fragment of the knowledge that is out there because um, it's just not possible to know everything. But whenever you find something that you don't know, if you have the time at that moment, make a moment and go and find out what that particular thing means. That very moment, not later on. Later on, okay, sometimes if you're really busy, but you need to know that, then okay, you can do it later on. But make a note. I remember my uncle when we were kids and sometimes we would show up 
uh, when we were at his house and he was talking. He was very educated. He had a PhD in physics and he was a professor in the university and he got his PhD in physics uh, from France and he was highly educated. He was, he, he was a author of most physics books where I was in the country that I was, uh, uh, I finished my high school and he uh, wrote all high school uh, physics books as one of the authors and um, many of the university, uh, uh, of course, uh, textbooks and uh, of course he was a um, professor of the university for years. And then uh, I remember when we were at his home and he was telling us about stories of life and education and different topics and so on. If there was a word that came on into the conversation, that its context, its meaning was not clear, he would get up and go get the dictionary and he says, every time, and I learned that, that was before I went to university. And I did the same throughout my university and it was very helpful to me. He said, if you come across a word that you don't know, find that what it means right then and there. Go get your dictionary and find it because that is the time you've come across that word. You will not have come across of it maybe in the near future, but it is worth to take that few moments and track it down in the dictionary. Find out what it means because it can be a root for your understanding about some other words, some other time, somewhere else. And that way you can increase your knowledge and save lots of time by someday when you come across a word and you got to go back to see what it means and that word that it means what it means it's still you don't know you got to go back to that the meaning of that word and so on and so forth and i've done that some word i didn't understand in the textbook of university when i was studying in i said oh that's what it means well, i don't know what this means so i got to have to go back and find the meaning of that word and five or six uh, you know meanings later i found that oh what that this word really meant the roots of it there. So if you do it every time that you come across a word that you don't know, it'd be helpful for your uh, efficiency in what you want to learn in the future and all the time. So um, what was the, wh wh where did I go there? It says, uh, how did you deal with philosophical, oh, how did you deal with philosophical OCD? It feels for me like I enjoy seeking truth also, sometimes it feels frightening. Okay, yeah, it's not frightening. That knowledge is unlimited. That's what I said. But I don't understand what you mean by philosophical OCD. Like, you have an OCD to know everything? No. OCD is OCD. Don't. <laughs> no OCD is really that good. So, and um, uh, Namita says, please tell me how to deal when you get anxious about certain... Oh, yeah, we talked about that. Chester says, I had weird OCD tics when I was young. I had to check if I locked the door two or three times. Yeah, oh, yeah. I even had a weird urges of swearing out loud or sticking middle finger in public. Uh, or school. Yeah, lots of different kind of uh, behavior. And sometimes it was like somebody said something and then we had learned that, oh, in order to make sure that that bad thing would not happen to my parents or to something or to my exam would not be ruined, I have to do this and then do this and then do this and then blow at it a few times. It was all weird stuff that it was like you had believed somehow that has anything to do with the stopping from some bad thing to happen, all in pursuit of security of some kind, uh, which is the nature of a human being is looking for security and how he can secure it and to the point that he can actually uh, start dealing with some nonsense like, like this, you know, <laughs> stuff that some of us have dealt with and so on. And um, so we have... Uh, Garima says, 18, female India. Hello, Garima. Says, hey, hey, <laughs> Mehran, how to stop hoping that a person will come back into your life when they may or may not? Stop hoping for it. Live your life. Focus on building your life. Have ambitions and have uh, direction, plans, 
to accomplish what it is that you want to accomplish. And if they happen to come back to your life, you will see if they are still welcome and if you're still interested. But don't hang around and waiting with, because what you're doing, you're actually, through neuroplasticity, you make yourself to constantly wait longer and believe in there being the right match for you more and more and more, because you keep thinking about it, hoping for it, waiting for it. So you're training yourself to be good. You're conditioning yourself to be good in doing this constantly, which is not how you want to deal with this. You actually want to stop thinking that it's any interest for waiting for them to come back and look at the actual fact that they're not at the moment in your life. That means that's the fact, that's the actuality of it. Deal with this actuality rather than trying to ignore the actuality and hope for something that is not the actuality. And then waiting for it to come back to you and then say, oh, good thing I waited. No. You focus on your life, finish your studies, focus on what it is that you're interested in, you're going to accomplish, and go about building your life. And if at some point in life they did come back to your life and you were still interested, because I guarantee you, you will not be interested anymore. Why? Because at this point, you have a certain character, a certain understanding, and certain value in your own mind about yourself. And for that purpose, you have accepted or appreciated this particular person. But a year or two from now, you have a different character, different level of understanding and wisdom and expectation and standards. So the qualifications for the person to come to your life would also be different because you are not the same person. You are a different person then. Therefore, this very person that is interesting to you now and you would think you're hoping to for him to come back to you or not, you may not even value that character anymore because your expectation has gone higher and now you are finding some other characters to qualify, to be qualified according to your standards. And no longer do all the standards apply. So that person, even if he comes back to your life, you'll say, I, I was young, I didn't know better, but I have no interest in, in you now. So for that reason, don't wait for them, don't hope for them, just focus on what it is now. Right now what it is is that he's not in your life and Therefore, you are focusing on your life, building your life, and you're understanding this is how life is. Things, you know, come and go. And therefore, you will assess the situation later. And if such thing happens, you will see if it's useful for you or uh, valuable to you or suitable to you or not, and then you'll decide. Sub says, so sir, I'm now in trouble because I have used mushrooms about a four times. I use mushrooms. You mean the hallucination stuff? Psychedelic stuff? I don't use them anymore. You don't, you don't need to get out of reality to be in reality. This is reality. Deal with this. Instead of escaping from it and then hoping that when you're not here, then the challenges that are here will be vanish so by the time you come back they won't be here no if you don't clean your house and just leave your apartment and say oh i'm not there because i'm not there i've escaped from it i've gone to my friend's home and hoping that then when you come back because you weren't here then the problems and challenges the dirt and not cleanliness of your apartment the, the, the dirtiness of your apartment would also not be here it's wrong. When you come back, you were absent from this situation. But when you come back, the situation is still here because you didn't deal with it. You just escape away from it. So if you're in the real life and you find that, oh, I want to escape. I can't handle it. So you get all these bullshit drugs, psychedelic or whatever the shit they are that fuck up your brain. Well, when you come back from that shitty trip, whatever it is, same situation, same Homework, same deal, same people, same problems, same challenges still exist. So what did you do? You just stepped out for a second. But when you step back in, the dirt that you haven't cleaned in your apartment is still here. Just because you're not there doesn't mean that will be solved by itself. You still got to take the time and fix and clean up the apartment. And then it will be clean. So deal with whatever it is that you got to deal with. You don't need to escape from it by using mushrooms or 
whatever it is that you may use. So, deal with things. Learn how to deal with things. Don't escape from them. Deal with them. And Reborn says, Hi, Meron, male 21 from Chile. Ah, hello there. Says, a country far, far away. Ha <laughs> ha. How are you? I know where Chile is. As I told you, Chile, Captain Morales with the horse Huaso, broke the record of high jump with horse at 2 meter 47 centimeter. Still holds as the official record. So I know where Chile, and also lots of great uh, fruits <laughs> and wine. I'm not a drinker, but I know about the products of your country. And so we have T21, male from the UK. Hello, T. Says, how do I deal with the anxiety I get when I see good-looking guys? Well, you shouldn't get any anxiety because it is normal to notice good-looking guys as it is normal to notice good-looking horse, or good-looking dog, a good-looking handbag, a good-looking woman, good-looking car, good-looking anything. It's not an anxiety. It's good looks. Because you envy the fact that he's got the good looks and he's got better chance with the girls than you have because there's certain things about him that you wish you had Therefore, it brings a certain admiration, and you think this admiration translates to interest in this man in a romantic sexual way. These are all bogus interpretation of the brain because brain is so capable to fast association of words and conclusion things and weaves it out together, which is actually not true, but its ability to associate things is so hard that you get bamboozled and you think, oh, it means I'm interested in this guy. No, you just know this is good looks. That's it. The problem is that you all interpret instead of observe. If you just focus on the observation, you observe that this thing, this person, this animal looks good. That's it. But you go further into perception. What does that mean? Oh, that means, oh, good looks means he's got good chance with girls. Oh, he's got big muscle. And big muscle. I use my big muscle in the gym to train so I could look good and perform better and have my girlfriend like me or the girls like me. So that muscle and the same as my muscle and then the whole association with the concept of sex comes to the picture. And then you think, oh, I thought about sex when I saw the muscle of this guy. That means I am homosexual. Not a sad. It's just association of what the brain does. You are supposed to simply stick with observation. Yeah, good looking man. So what? I'm good looking too, you say to yourself. Or that dog is good looking. Or that girl is good looking. Fine. For that's the way. We are designed to recognize good designs and good structures and good looks and good colors and good color combinations. We're designed to appreciate these things. So these are okay. It's normal to notice someone's good look. But because you also envy, you see them as a threat to your chances to get the girls, you get an anxious anxiety. And that anxiety makes you interpret all kinds of associations and you get to a place that you had no idea, had no interest in it, and then you conclude some shit. Because we are accustomed and been um, conditioned to deal with conclusions rather than fragments of what it is, an observation. Uh, the words mean something. So when you see some guys good looking and the association of the bra brain brings it to the word of sex and the concept of sex, and suddenly you're now dealing with concept of sex and the male being the in the in, in this uh, association, then the concept of um, the homosexuality comes in, and now you're dealing with a conclusion, not just the mere simple fact that you observed a good looking man. You're dealing with a conclusion where the association of this observation had brought about. That's all fucked up. Don't. Stop at the uh, 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 observation. Oh, yeah, good looking man. Oh, good. Good for him. Yeah, well, maybe I should also wear like that so I look good so, you know, girls would like me more. Just, you know, that's it. You have to uh, say, oh, why should I notice his good looks? Oh, well, he's good looking. We're designed to notice good looks of anything. So that's normal. Don't worry about it. 
Krishna or was I? No. Yeah, sensation of the body is the anxiety. Anxiety flows the blood and the blood flows and moves things and you think, oh, it's because of that. No, it's because of anxiety. So don't worry about it. And anxiety is because you interpret the observation. Don't interpret observation. Just observe. Okay, good looking. Great. Yeah, yeah. It's envy. And the envying being certain kind of a admiration. It's that certain kind of admiration that he's got better chance with the girls because of it looks good, brings a certain kind of a feeling of inferiority. That feeling of inferiority leads to associates with the fact of, oh, then I admire him, then I think I am interested in him because all that brings about all kind of shit that uh, neither here nor there at all and never was the intention. So stop interpreting it. And the association will not get, uh, you know, um, out of line. <laughs> All right. Manny says, when I try to accept these thoughts, OCD may makes false attraction to men by making eye contact I have to look away therefore they see and I think if I'm mean, no fuck don't even look away. don't look or don't look away neither one is interesting you see someone good looking okay good looking you don't stand there interpret it and then debate it oh, why did I notice it's good looking because it's good looking so what that's it, because you appreciate good looking, because you like to be good looking. Maybe you are, or maybe you like to be, or however it is. Everybody is good looking, but you notice someone's more symmetric and so on, and you think they've got the good chance with the girls, and then it brings your attention more to them, then you interpret that with your interest in them. It's not. Your interest in the fact that they're good looking, they have better chance with them, and then anxiety of it because of interpretation. Fast interpretation make you think that, oh, you actually means you might be interested in the guy. Because then the OCD and the intrusive thoughts also takes over because it's been constantly there and it's trained to think that way uh, by default now. you got to retrain it. I say, hey, it's okay. It wants to suggest to me that I'm interested in the guy. Okay. It can suggest. doesn't matter. I'm not going to, okay, no, I have to prove to my brain. What's the brain? I have to prove to the brain. Why should you have to prove to the brain? It's an apparatus. It's like you're trying to uh, prove to your ass. It's an intestine. It's an it's an organ. You don't have to prove anything to it. Just say something. You say, oh, yeah, it's good looking, but I'm not interested in sex with the guy or any guy to touch me. That's the end of it. That's the extent of it. Otherwise, you don't even have to say that. Just say, oh, yeah, good looking. And then thought of weird things comes into your mind to your standards. It's weird. You say, oh, gee, I'm interested in that. And go. So the more you ignore, and the more it reconditions your brain. Don't be afraid of thoughts. Thoughts show up and say, okay, gay? Okay, maybe I'm gay. So I'm not scared of it, because I know I'm not. So I'm not uh, going to be afraid of saying, okay, you want to think I'm gay? Think I'm gay. I know I'm not. So brain wants to think, I don't care. Because what's the brain? Brain is not me. So you can think what it's like I walk in the street if somebody thinks I'm gay. Does it matter to me? No, it's somebody else thinking I'm gay. Same thing. It's the brain thinking I'm gay. It's not me thinking I'm gay. It's the brain trying to suggest that, okay, I don't give a fuck. It's like somebody in the street thinks I'm gay. Okay, fine. All right, well, I don't care. I know what it is, what I'm interested in. That's the end of it. That's enough. So the rest of it, ah, it's okay. So big deal. Yeah. Maybe I am. So what? I'm not acting on it, so what? That way you kind of diminish this whole focus on what word was used, what thought was used. I have to defy it. I have to, you don't have to do anything. You are who you are. It doesn't change you. All these thoughts, all these opinions, all these people say whatever they say. They have different intentions, different motivations. They could say shit for their, uh, serving their own purpose. You don't have to pay attention to it. Otherwise, you'll be running around trying to debate with different things and different things that is uh, not of interest to you. And you shouldn't waste your life like that. All right.
<laughs> Sab says, yes, I wrote that question before you um, mentioned you're not a doctor. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good. And Namita says, yes, it's been a while since I joined your live session. I've been okayish. How have you been? Ah, yeah, good. Thank you very much. Still uh, busy with these things. And Namita says, my anxiety is mainly regarding a guy I love. And we have two years to move in together. And I feel like I'm being naive thinking about the future. It keeps me up at night because two years is a long time. Well, you don't have to worry about the two years from now. Right now, live your life. And when you see it's two years to live together, if you guys are still uh, in relationship, maybe that relationship lasts, and then you guys move in together. Maybe in this two years, relationship doesn't last. Either way, that's how it was going to be. So did you want to move in now, and before the two years is up, you guys separate? That would be even worse. So... Between now and two years from now, you at least will strengthen or see how the relationship is moving on. So when you move in, you at least have, you know, two years, give it time and check each other out, uh, you know, a little bit longer. Uh, rather than moving in now and then within two years, find out that things are not really, uh, you guys can't be that compatible and then break it off. So uh, live your life. If you guys are in the same city, you continue seeing each other if you guys are not well that's a test to see if you guys gonna uh, you know um, still uh, be in relationship two years from now and if you were great if you weren't that's the way it's gonna be that's a big deal don't be afraid of it don't let anxiety rule your life two years is a long time you don't know what's gonna happen so live your life day by day and then uh, you'll decide when the two years comes around and we have Sohel Aman Khan says, relation between OCD, Sohel, where's your age? Where's your age? You're from India, I can see that. But I need to know your age as well. So I read your question until you give me that. It says, a relation between OCD, bipolar disorder, and creativity, I am suffer by both. After being patient, my perception of life are changed. I published two papers in my bachelor's first year. Now I'm in third year. Um... Yeah, and the rest of it. Twenty years old. Thank you for that, Aman. So, you know, to understand OCD and how important it is for you to understand what it is and deal with it by your knowledge, by research, understanding, and having knowledge about how it works. And there is a video that I have in the description of uh, all videos in those two playlists. It's a presentation done by Dr. Schwartz, Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz. He's a neuroscience a scientist and in that particular presentation, he talks about neuroscience of habit and describes the experiment of Dr. Anne Grable uh, using a experiment done by one of, his, one of her uh, postgraduate uh, students, uh, Carl Smith, in regards to neuroscience of habits experience they've made uh, with rats and it's very interesting so i have that uh, that um, link there for you to watch it's i think 29 or 45 minutes and it's loads of information 
which I've described it many times in these live talks, but I don't want to go through it because it's lots of talking. <laughs> and it will help you to see the relationship between OCD, which is obsession, and then there's a compulsion. And through doing the compulsion, you feel good. And when you feel good, dopamine is released. And when dopamine is released, you feel good about it. So that's another motivation, other than the fact that you feel that you got to do compulsion when the obsession shows up. You also want to do compulsion because there's going to be a dopamine at the end of it, and that makes you feel even better. You did the compulsion, you feel good, and you have a release of dopamine, you feel wow. And then after a while, you're no longer doing the compulsion because of the obsession. You're doing the compulsion because every time you do it, there's a dopamine release, and that is your motivation, your new motivation. And then after a while, when you keep doing it for the reason of getting dopamine, then no longer you're going to be doing it for the obsession or the dopamine. You're actually going to turn it into a habit. And now you're doing it for yeah, dopamine and the habit. The habit would be the reason, the main reason that you're doing it unconditionally. The fact that you get dopamine out of it too, it encourages it and reconditions you and conditions you further and further into it. That's why it's very important to deal with OCD and HOCD stuff by understanding, educating yourself and understanding the separation between brain, thoughts and you so you can actually see how it works and not to be bamboozled by it and not to allow dopamine keep being released by doing the compulsion constantly and cutting the compulsion so dopamine will not be released to encourage you to keep doing it until it becomes a habit. Because reward center, goal finding center, and reward center, dopamine, and habit center, they're all on the same circle on top of each other called the striatum. And that is the danger of not educating yourself about OCD and HOCD and so on because it, when it becomes habit, then uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult to get rid of it. Then you got to uh, connect the uh, discontinuation of this behavior to health reasons to motivate you further to actually come to uh, accomplishments of not continuing the um, the OCD or the intrusive thoughts by reconditioning yourself because you have uh, understood the importance of it for the healthy lifestyle and for general health. But before it gets to habit, to need to focus on health reasons and general health benefits to use it to counter this habit and get out of the habit, you deal with it when it's in the compulsion level, it'll be easier. All right. Yeah, so what you're doing, you're actually, uh, because when you do the compulsion, whether it's actually checking the door a few times or washing your hands or turning the uh, switch on or off, when you're doing this, uh, that compulsion, completing the compulsion cycle will release the dopamine. And that's the same reason why you think these thoughts are actually enjoyable because it's not the thought that is enjoyable is the fact that when you comply with the compulsion with your thoughts attending to them or paying attention to them and dealing with them data hunting with them debating with them and so on it's the compulsion and when you do that you feel like okay I've dealt with it and releases a dopamine and now it's the dopamine that makes you think that you're enjoying it not the actual uh, thoughts that it shows up so you got to be aware of it. So the sooner you cut that out, then the dopamine will not get into the picture, make you think that you're actually enjoying the process or the existence of these thoughts. It's the compulsion, whatever it is that you do with the thoughts, getting engaged with them, it's a compulsion. And when you do that compulsion, dopamine is released. And that dopamine is what you're looking forward. That's what you think is the enjoyment it is for the thoughts. It's not for the thoughts. It's for the dopamine. 
All right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sub Sub says I used it. I used the drug when I was young and immature. I used it with the intention to understand why the brain has different perspective and vision, not for the pleasure or escape. I just doubt if the room is still the same or has become even more messier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. None of these drugs are good. I remember when I was in. Uh, I remember I was in. Um, college in library it was about 10 o'clock and I think the library was open till 12 and I hadn't seen a friend of mine uh, one of my best friends um, who was a year higher than me in university and uh, I hadn't seen him for like three days and then he showed up uh, to a library and came and sat in front of my desk when I was studying and I said, what's going on? Where have you been? He started crying. I said, what's going on? He said, somebody had uh, put a LSD in my tea. And he said, I think I know who it was. And he said, for 18 hours, I was in my room and everything was weird. The bed was getting bigger and smaller. And the room, the walls were going nuts. And I was just didn't know what to do for 18 hours i locked myself in the room i couldn't deal with anything i didn't know what was going on so i said come on get up let's go get some ice cream at mcdonald's i guess <laughs> somewhere <laughs> the poor guy was devastating and uh, that was the first time that i really pretty much kind of not first time but you know a close friend told me that this is the experience that he had which uh, you know to me is just you know, detrimental to them, to anyone's uh, safety or health. Who knows what would have happened that 18, that 18 hours. <clears throat> Damn senses, how do I get over betrayal from my brother? Well, look, I don't know how old you are. I don't know anything about you. Why don't you tell me which country you come from, how old you are, something. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, damn sense, everything is a protocol, right? A hello or something. <laughs> and so Hale says, I'm thinking how to detect psychological disorder using a thermal abnormality, RMIT, university, we do this for OCD by computer, without help of doctor, I don't want people suffer that pain, I feel before, any suggestions for parameter should I consider, I don't quite understand what you just said, so I need to educate myself about what it is that you're saying, uh, I kind of s trying to see something in there that you want to create a program that kind of diagnoses or helps with uh, getting rid of the OCD. I'm thinking how to detect psychological disorder. Well, you don't have to detect it. Everybody can detect it themselves right away. You know. But one of the One of the ways that, as I mentioned, um, body finds a security through physicality, environment, like you know where your muscles are, face, head, you know, legs, everything is, and you, you, you know your muscles, your physical uh, entity is secure, especially when you know you're sitting in your home, door is locked, and you're in a good uh, neighborhood, uh, let's say, of the city, and you feel safe. But brain, your mind, doesn't find its security 
uh, through physicality. It finds insecurity in occupation. So when you are busy doing mindful exercises, you're giving the brain mind an opportunity to relax, to find security in that exercise. That's why meditation is very good to feel secure. And when the mind is not disciplined, it goes rogue and tries to find occupation, meaning finding and creating thoughts which is not being told what kind of thoughts, so it finds any kind of thoughts that it thinks it's a thought that it can uh, conjure up. And that is the way it tries to find security for itself. So the, to understand that the, when the mind is not disciplined to be ready for you to call upon it, and yet it goes, roams around because it doesn't have a place in the body to reside. Therefore, it finds no place for it to be its home. So it's all over the place. One minute is the other country. One minute is to Mars. And second minute is here. And before you know it, it's ready to go again. Because it has no place. It hasn't been trained to stay in one place. So that's why when we meditate, you're teaching the brain discipline to have a place in the body like the other parts of the body, then mind and body would both be focused and concentrated and coordinated in the same entity, rather than mind that doesn't have a physicality could be all over the place and the body has physicalities here. So mind and body are separated. That's when then it goes all active. But when the mind is trained to know that it has a place in the body and you teach it through meditation, which you have covered, through this, uh, in, in many of these videos that I have, it teaches the mind to find a place and to know where in the body it can also focus. And after a while, it will be its residence, its place of relaxation, rather than finding its place of security and relaxation in occupation, which would mean creating thoughts which among it would be all kinds of thoughts, intrusive thoughts or not, because that is the brain that is undisciplined, hasn't learned and conditioned to be trained to behave in a certain way. Like a horse that hasn't been trained how to walk or, or trot or jump or gallop or dressage techniques, it just wild, goes anywhere and has a mind of its own. And every time you want to use it, you got to go grab it in the pasture, bring it, put a saddle on, sit on it, and take it somewhere that you want to go. But versus the, the horse that you have trained it and is very proper, saddled up, ready, waiting here, not running around until you need it and you jump on it and you go and take care of your business. So the brain is also the same. Through meditation, you'll discipline it, teach it that it too has a place in the body to be rather than not having a place in the body and therefore all over the place, scattered around and then right in, and then uh, uh, crosses out with different topics in its travels and moving about and comes up with all kinds of uh, thoughts when it, um, when it crosses any kind of a topic as it travels and becomes aware and aware of all different things that exist. So it makes thoughts with it. Whatever it comes across, it makes thoughts with it. But when it's learned and disciplined to be in a place when it's trained to be and learns that's a place it can focus and feel safe and doesn't have to be running around or making thoughts and through making thoughts and being occupied to find security, then it will not make all those so many intrusive thoughts because it doesn't need to make in thoughts in order to feel safe or secure. It just relaxes knowing that it has a place in the body and the mind and body are coordinated and they move together and they will be ready for you to call upon it to serve you. Whether it's your body you want it to do something for you or it's your brain, mind that you want it to do something for you. So it won't be rogue running around. It'll be like a well-trained dog or well-trained horse that it's waiting for your command. So, <sighs> Subsessor, even with a strong perspective and mindfulness like you, do the intrusive thoughts still come and possibly cause anxiety? Yes, it does. But knowing about what they are, 
It's tremendous help. It doesn't give you anxiety so much anymore because you look at them and observe them as what they are. You don't make them a concept or a conclusion. You look at them as a fragment, an observation. Yeah? And that would end there. Okay, I saw a rat running. That's it. I saw a rat running. Now, so, oh, I saw a rat. It carries that disease. What if it comes and bites me? Maybe it was in my own home. All that is not what you observed. It's conjuring up all kinds of things or the brain spawning in negativity, coming up, making all these thoughts because, again, it finds its security in occupation and its occupation means making thoughts and the thoughts is going to be made on the subject that it was observed because when it sees something, it starts associating with all kinds of things that it can and for that reason, it goes beyond the observation of the rat and it has come to be in a story and a connection with some kind of association with concepts and then you got to deal with some conclusion that was never in the picture. So focus on observing and that's where it is. Observation. That's it. I observed this. Okay. That's it. You know, a, a chocolate uh, wrapping. That's it. Observe. Now you want to perceive it. Oh, I saw another chocolate wrapping somewhere else and that chocolate wrapping was laced with cyanide and I should make sure I don't touch it. Suddenly it turned out way beyond observation. So, Yeah, so, uh, yeah, intrusive thoughts, it's part of life. It's part of the malfunction of the brain. It's part of distraction of the brain. And brain is that. That's why meditation is very helpful. Mindful exercise is very helpful. Yeah. Um, Reborn says, this anxiety you mentioned is annoying. I often felt false feelings that causes much more fear. It's a cycle induced by a bad interpreter. Yeah. Don't interpret, just observe, and that's the end of it. Don't worry about it. And Reborn says, I must stop being so tragic. <laughs> now I can see the theme of being gay so small and inoffensive because I know I'm not. There you go. That's it. But the fact is we've been conditioned to want to prove everything from childhood. Anything we said, no, you're stupid. Oh, I had to prove it. Argument with everybody, teacher, friends, parents. Always prove it. No, I'm this. No, I'm that. Because we've always been conditioned that we are not good enough by the society. We have to be more. Now we say something, there's a you know, a, a challenge against it. Now i got to prove it. This proving that I'm more, that I'm right, that I have to prove something in order to put my opinion into place has become a condition, a default condition of yours. Now, to the point that you actually want to prove to your fucking brain something. What is brain that you want to prove? It's part of it. It's like your ass. It's like you're trying to prove something to your ass. Leave it. Don't pay attention to what this says. This is an apparatus. It's a tool. It's not you. It doesn't matter. It's not an intellect. It's just a machine. Like your intestine. It's full of shit. Only different kind. So, I hope that <laughs> puts it in perspective, proper perspective, and frees you from being so uh, focused on what it says. It doesn't matter. It's bullshit. It's like people say shit out there. You pay attention to them. No, you just pass by. Same thing here. Um, so hell says so is okay. Intermix is 29 male. I have HOCD. Doing exposure is making me worse because my mind tells me that I like doing it. I cannot tell the difference anymore from false attraction. Well, you know, you're, you're interpreting too much. Talk to your psychotherapist. Make him or her clear this up for you. 
Now, mitos is, uh, that makes sense. I try not to overthink it uh, through, but it can be difficult. But I will work on being more in control of my thoughts. Any suggestion for that? Yeah, just focus on the moment. Uh, instead of waiting for two years to see if you're going to move in with that person or not. Is that, is that what you were talking about? I think you were the one who were talking about moving with someone in two years. I believe that was it. Anyhow, I hope I'm not mixing up things. But you focus on the moment, on your efforts. Do not focus on the outcome or the results of what you're trying to accomplish. Put your focus on the efforts that you're making on the way to accomplish something. And make your happiness towards the efforts on the way to accomplish something. Not wait for the accomplishment and then be satisfied. Because then dopamine would be created only once when you accomplish the tax, task. But you want the dopamine, the good feeling of that you're advancing and hopefulness, you want it to be created with every effort towards accomplishing something, not when you accomplish something. So you bring your hope to the effort level. And then you will constantly be feeling good because dopamine is created because you made an effort towards accomplishing that thing. And it, by the time it accomplishes, you've been feeling good all the time of what because of what you're doing. Not only once and always in, in, impatient for it to accomplish, to finish before you can be happy. You'll be happy while you're trying to finish it. And that's very important. Sub says, or if anything gives you, what if everything that gives you dopamine by natural secretion becomes a compulsion even when it wasn't a consequence of, of obsession? No, you have a reason for doing it. You, you, you ride a bicycle, you feel good. Okay, dopamine is created, you feel happy. But otherwise, uh, it won't become what you're trying to suggest that it becomes. Uh, what if everything that gives you dopamine by natural selection becomes a compulsion? No, it doesn't. It doesn't because you don't have an obsession to do that one thing that simply gave you dopamine. But you get dopamine if you're playing tennis and you enjoy it but you're going to play tennis because you it makes you feel good. It's a sport. It's an activity. You have a socialization. There are many reasons for you to play tennis. It's not only for the dopamine. Dopamine is one of them. But it does have an effect on uh, something that you want to pursue when it makes you feel good. Well, why not? Makes you feel good. Gives you dopamine too. That's what is there. Because dopamine encourages you to continue something that makes you feel good. That's why it's very important for you to choose what makes you feel good to be also good for you. In other words, don't choose using drugs or alcohol because you make you feel good and it also gives you, you know, dopamine and then you end up doing something to get the dopamine that is actually not good for you. So many things can make you feel good, but you got to make sure what makes you feel good is also good for you. Otherwise, as you said, it could cause you become addicted or encouraged to do something because it makes you feel good, but that what makes you feel good is not necessarily good for you. So your judgment here is what's going to regulate what you choose. It's not just automatically. You can command, you can veto or choose this for this reason, even though it gives me dopamine, it's not where I want to get my dopamine because it's not a good thing for my health. Therefore, you will not choose that. Your judgment should be your guide, not you know, feeling good. If that was the case, you'd be doing many shit things that makes you feel good. Because almost everything can make you feel good. Even if you scratch your ass, it could make you feel good because there's so many sensories there. Skin, if you have a scab on your skin and you scratch it or a pimple, you scratch your mosquito bite. You scratch, you feel good. Oh, it's orgasmic. Ha, ah, ha, ah, very good. But what does that mean? Is that what you want to become addicted to? 
scratch your ass all the time, then it could lead to some other things, thinking that whatever makes me feel good must be good for... No, you make judgments. Hey, look, it feels good, but it's not something that I want to go further than just scratching it because, I, got, I don't know, some fungus there or didn't wash it well. Or, you know, you, even though it makes you feel good to scratch your uh, scab or pimple or mosquito bite, you say, well, it's going to get infected because if I keep scratching it, it's going to get uh, um, the... Um, staph infection because every one of us underneath our fingernails have staph uh, bacteria in there so you don't want to scratch the uh, mosquito bite even though it feels orgasmic and feels oh very good but you make a judgment because you know the hazards of it or something that you are not actually wanting to lead that way then you make a judgment that oh, i'm just not going to do it like that so your judgment, I know these are, uh, these are examples that uh, to be uh, funny, uh, but at the same time brings your attention to notice what the point is here. The point is your veto choices and judgment is your savior from all these things that is out there, whether it makes you feel good or not. Hmm? You've got to make a judgment based on your values, your principles, your morals, your faith whatever it is your inclination is of different kinds in this life. So you use your values, what you hold sacred, to guide you in choices that you make, not just based on, oh, it makes me feel good because it gives me dopamine, so I got to do it. No. Lots of things makes you feel good. But always remember, what makes you feel good should also be good for you. But not everything that makes you feel good is necessarily good for you. Got to watch for these things. All right. Sub says, by the way, I'm Afghan, ethnically living in the Netherlands, 20 years old. Ah, okay. So you must speak Farsi, or at least uh, understand. I'm sure you speak Farsi. So, and um, Asap says, Kaye says, hi, my name is Kaye, 23-year-old from U.S. U.S. is a big place. What part of U.S.? says, I have experienced distance from my mind for half a day. I'm able to observe my thoughts without engaging in them, but I'm not able to maintain it all day. You're not supposed to maintain it all day because you've got things to do. But at all times, you can simply... Observe your thoughts, because what is observing your thought is not a deity. It's not somebody watching you. It's your own thoughts, watching your thoughts from that. And then there could be another thought watching that thought that is watching your thoughts. You can go on and on that way. But it's just your time. You're not supposed to constantly watching your thoughts. That's where you just leave it and you end it with allowing your judgment to decide when it is necessary for you to make a judgment on a certain quality of a thought that has showed up. Is it beneficial to you? Should I veto it or should I pursue it? Should I use it or should I let it go and ignore it? That is when you use it. Otherwise, there is always a certain kind of a thought that is watching. That's the watcher. If you watch one of my videos, is um, the quality of your life, watcher and the watched, controller and the controlled. And in that, observer and observed, in that discussion, you will understand what I'm talking about. And I also have recently made a bunch of videos talking about the brain. Let me see if I can find uh, that for you, which can help you to uh, see the experiments that I suggested there, which is very interesting. I have to change the title of these to make a more clear title. Uh, for example, I have one video called Who's Talking to God? Intrusive Thoughts, Brain, You, and Short Version. That is uh, 
possibly is going to help you to see what I'm talking about, that when you are discussing or thinking about something, there is another thought that is watching you. And perhaps this would be something that would clarify what I'm, what I'm uh, referring to here. So I'm going to put the link here, and uh, you can find this, you can follow this after the uh, video, after the things, and you understand. Uh, perhaps this would be a good uh, uh, response to your question, or clarify it for you a little bit. And Sub says, um, even though the thoughts come, is it constantly or within long-term period I began to experience the thoughts halfway 2018, around two months later, I felt normal like before until January 2021? doesn't matter. You just understand the process of it. When it happens, you know why it happens, you know how to deal with it, how to manage it, and that's all it matters. It's like saying, I got a cold or I got a diarrhea and then it went away and then uh, I wonder why I got diarrhea. Because it happens. It's a physical malfunction. And then you deal with it because every time you know what it is and you know how to deal with it and how to manage it and it'll then, you know, you have been able to manage it. The same thing with brain. It's a little bit more uh, 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 challenging, but if you understand it, then at least you know what it is. Okay, it's another diarrhea. I don't pay so much attention to it, but I know what it is, and I know how to manage it. I know how to treat it and help myself to rewire myself. And by ignoring it and the stuff that we talked about, you deal with it. So uh, don't expect to have a perfect and uh, you know, a, a brain that never malfunctions. Our brain is not perfect. It's still work in progress. It's just new, and it hasn't really been uh, properly developed. It's only 40,000 years, years old versus, you know, our whole system that is, comes from a million years ago. So uh, there are malfunctions bound to happen. So understanding why it, and how it malfunctions, it helps you to manage it and go on with rewiring it and uh, managing its malfunctioning. So Helen says, 20 years, last question, I always feel that my head becomes hot with little pressure and pain. Yeah, because you're anxious in there and you're kind of concerned about it, what it is, you're trying to determine what it means and trying to go to the tangents and you're angry about it and disturbed about it. What is this? What is that? Does it mean I'm not perfect? Does it mean this means something? No, I just... Ignore it, you'll not have a pain in the head at all. Just ignore it, you know? Because really, all that matters, you know who you are, what you're interested in, the rest doesn't matter. Whether people say something or your brain suggests something, you say shit with it, I don't care. I know who I am, what I want, what I'm interested in, what I'm not interested in, that's all that matters. And... Namita says, you make so much sense. I agree with you. Thank you for this. You're quite welcome. So Hell says, uh, thank you. I got knowledge from you, which I want. Good. I'm delighted, uh, Sohil. And Namita says, aha, uh, scratch your ass, Mehran. You never fail to make me laugh. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never fail to make myself laugh either. And uh, Sub says, no, I understand you completely. Okay, good. Aditya, Aditya says, hi, 23 male India. I have loved girls whole my life. Had a girlfriend for six years, but a year back I had a very slight groanal response after seeing a naked man. Yeah, yeah, because it gives you anxiety for all kind of reasons and one reason is that you see naked naked body the brain associates naked your naked body 
represents sex, sex with women, that's what you are into. Another person's naked body, a man's naked body, also connects and associates with sex with women, and the concept of sex is there, but because the concept of sex has come to the uh, mind, then you mistakenly says, oh, seeing the naked body of the man is why I think of sex. No, it's the concept of sex because brain association ability is very fast. Naked, sex. Doesn't matter what it is. You look at the horse's ass, it's round, it's shiny, sex. But you say, oh, what am I talking about? You see a body, a statue of a naked statue in the middle of the city, whether made out of bronze or made out of a steel or a marble, it's smooth, it's round, legs, naked body, reminds of sex. So there is a reaction for the concept of sex, nakedness. Naked brings sex. Sex to you brings sex with women. This concept, without you actually analyzing it, noticing it, its meaning and conclusions are there when the brain associates these words and these scenes. And then reaction is to the concept of sex, not to that statute, not to that horse's ass, not to that male body, is to the concept that the brain associates that scene to the concept of sex. Because you see your own naked body with sex. You associate it with sex, sex with women. So you see another naked body of a man, you associate that with sex. And that concept takes a whole different tangent and brings about a reaction, and then you say, oh, that reaction was because I saw that man. No, that reaction was for the concept of sex. So don't interpret anything. It doesn't matter. You get anxious, the blood moves because of anxiety, and when it moves, it moves everything. You know, some women could see a naked body of a woman, and they get anxious because they may see a competition. They may see that that woman is, is more beautiful or they may see the naked body association with sex and that could create an anxiety and flow of blood and the flow of blood. They could feel something at their nipples and they say, oh, I had a, a movement. Or they could feel something uh, down uh, there where their uh, sexual part is and they could say, oh, oh I saw another woman. And I felt, no, it's the concept of sex because nakedness has an association with the same thing that your naked body associates with in thoughts and then you react your body reacts to the concept that the brain is pointing towards not to that person or that same gender it's not the gender that you're reacting to it's a concept that represents nakedness represents sex and that sex concept of sex is what you're reacting to so in other words Relax. <laughs> All right. Yeah, don't worry about it, Atiyah. It's good. Uh, Kaya says, yes, I understand. The observer is also observed. Thank you from the link. I'll take a look at that video. Okay, good. Uh, Reborn says, wow, you made a really good point. We expect to be always without thoughts and things to judge. And it's a lie. The life in part consists of, uh, consists and master that. And uh, the problem with it. Sub says, I believe the anxiety comes from God to understand and adapt change into ourselves become a higher intellectual. Well, you know, let, let's don't make it religious self because <laughs> we got to understand what's going on in our head. We don't want to have God responsible, uh, you know, for this or that so forth. Just, um, and says higher intellectual by understanding how life could be. Do you also have a spiritual belief in the cause of mental or physical disabilities that there's a positive and ideal meaning of the abnormalities in your way of life excluding science i don't know it's just that we got to deal with shit all kind of shit that we got to deal with you know it's like uh, life is uh, full of suffering and we got to do our best to figure out how to deal with these sufferings otherwise you expect life to be perfect well then we wouldn't be uh, on the imperfect 
environment that we're living in would be in a perfect environment. As the environment is not perfect, so is all these challenges. And so we just got to have to do our best instead of thinking if there is a reason for it or what. Now, I don't know if there is any divine reasons for putting us in all the shit that we end up having to deal with or not, but we still have to be resilient, survive, and be determined, and focus on learning and educating ourselves to withstand all these challenges and come victorious over these challenges by understanding education through neuroscience, through science, through psychology, to all these things that can help us to manage better and negotiate our life a little bit better than we could otherwise. All right, guys, looks like that we are now two hours, 22 and minutes and 31, 32, 30 seconds and continuing, and we've answered all the questions. So I hope that you guys enjoyed it as much as I did and it was helpful to you and I will be uploading it as soon as it automatically is processed and ready to upload for your uh, review and, um, uh, you know, possibly wanting to uh, review it, as I said. <laughs> so uh, I look forward to talk to you next week, Saturday, 1 p.m. for North America and Europe. And then again next week, 8.30 or 9.00. Uh, p.m. Vancouver time, all Vancouver time, and all the appointments for Skype consultation is also Vancouver time. If you go on my site, mindthatseekstruth.com, mindthatseekstruth.com, want to make an appointment to talk to me one-on-one -on, -one on Skype, all the times that you're making the registration for that appointment is Vancouver time. So, uh, you know, convert it to your time and to see what time it will be. So if you say, 9 o'clock, that's 9 p.m., 21, 9 p.m. for me. For you, you got to figure out what it is. And so I look forward to uh, talk to you again. And in the meantime, please do share the videos on your social media and help this channel to grow. If you have enjoyed it, learned anything from it, and you're finding it helpful, then it would be wonderful of you if you share these uh, uh, promotional videos that I have, such as the one that I'm going to put up here for you to use it. It's only one minute and uh, 47 seconds, a short one. You can share it on your social media and help others to know that we have a live, live talk, live stream. Here it is, and you can use that and uh, advertise for the channel as far as promoting it to your uh, connections and so on. And help them to know that we have a live stream. They can come in here, ask their questions about thoughts, consciousness, fear, desire, ego, mechanical process, order, material process, OCD, HOCD, breakups, relationships, and movement of mind. So, let me take a breather before I say goodnight to you. And uh, Reborn says, thanks, Mehran. was a Good moment of conversation. Great. And Chester says, Mahalo, Mehran. Thanks for the two live stream today. Take care and see you next week, Saturday. Yes, and thank you very much. Mahalo, Chester. And thank you, everybody. Aloha and mahalo. And look forward to talk to you next Saturday. Be good to yourself to the others. I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.